Okay, the second approach to environmental ethics is based on a general respect for life. We could call it a biocentric ethic. There's a uh, one author I'll be referring to primarily here, a guy named Paul Taylor, but this is a this position is well represented. It's a general respect for all kinds of life, yet without going uh, as far as an Eastern uh, Jainism, for example, or some forms of Buddhism, of deifying nature. It would be the attitude perhaps expressed uh, uh, by Theodore Retke here, a poet from the University of Washington. Many arrivals make us live. The tree becoming green, a bird tripping the topmost bough, a seed pushing itself beyond itself, the mole making its way through darkest ground, the worm, intrepid scholar of the soil. Do these analogies perplex? A sky with clouds, the motion of the moon and waves at play, a sea wind pausing in a summer tree. What does what it should do needs nothing more. The body moves, though slowly, towards desire. We come to something without knowing why. What Retke is expressing here in his own way is a respect for the natural movements, uh, the natural things, just a deep respect uh, for life, uh, for nature. Is that sufficient to ground an environmental ethic? Paul Taylor describes what he calls the biocentric outlook. Anthropocentric would be focused on human beings, anthropos. Theocentric focused on God, theos. Biocentric focused on bios, on life. Four primary parts of the biocentric outlook. First of all, humans are members of the Earth's community of life in the same sense and on the same terms as other members of that community. Members of the community of life in the same sense and on the same terms as other members of that community. Now, we're all living things, of course. Uh, we all metabolize. Uh, all of us have DNA that's the same you know, from, from the smallest fungi to, to the largest mammals. Cells are structured on DNA. And so in that sense, perhaps we're in members of the body community in the same, on the same terms, in the same sense. But Taylor means something more than that. He wants to say that humans are not special in any sense. But he does it this way. He says, we do not deny the differences between ourselves and other species any more than we deny the differences among the species themselves. Rather, we put aside those differences and focus our attention upon our nature as biological creatures. But look what Taylor is doing when he says that. He is asking human beings to use what makes us different in order to put aside our difference. If we were not able to think rationally, imaginatively, to abstract ourselves out of our natural environment, in other words, if we were not able to use human rationality, we could not put aside human rationality. Therefore, we cannot be members of the body community in the same sense and on the same terms. It's a self-defeating claim. Now, beyond that, common sense tells us that human energy, uh, the ability to significantly alter our environment, both locally and globally, necessarily puts us, members of the body community or the community of life, on different terms. Beavers build dams that change the courses of streams. They, they, they turn streams into marshes, and the marshes fill up with aspens, and then the pine and the spruce creep in. Uh, what was a meadow becomes a forest, and then the beavers have to move upstream. They, they build lodges. Termites build, in some parts of the world, tremendous houses. Other birds build nests. But only human beings can change the environment massively and globally. Just imagine if Brezhnev and Nixon had pushed the button and nuclear war had ensued, how different the world would be. We have that capacity. Since we have that capacity as humans, 
it becomes very difficult to know what it means to say we are members of the community of life on the same terms, in the same sense. We have to use the differences to manage those differences. Second, he says all species, including humans, are integral elements in a system of interdependence. Well, I have no quarrel with that. Um, we breathe out carbon dioxide, the plants use carbon dioxide in their metabolism, we eat things in the lower in the food chain. You know, it's, it's part of the process. We're, we're members of the uh, community of life and a system of independence. I can't quarrel with that. Third, each organism has its own good which it pursues in its own way. He says everything that is alive can correctly be said to have a good. That one might fare well or poorly, be benefited or harmed, achieve or fail to achieve one's own good, these things so central to the meaning of our everyday existence can be asserted literally and without distortion about animals and plants as well as ourselves. Well, so far, yes. I know what it is uh, for sheep to have a good. I know what it is for palm trees to have certain environments uh, that are good for them, that they flourish. But difficulties lurk in the neighborhood. One of these difficulties is the fact that what's good for one organism might be bad for another. Uh, we think, for example, of, of predator-prey relations. Uh, what's good for the great white shark may not be good for a whole lot of other things. Or uh, cases of parasitism. Um, in the Rocky Mountains, many of the bighorn sheep suffer from lungworm disease. Now, the bighorn sheep are really good for the lungworm, but the lungworm is really bad for the sheep. So to make a, a claim that each organism has its own good, which it pursues its own way, to make that a basis of a moral claim, it just isn't going to work. Taylor needs to say more. He needs to pay more attention to those differences. And finally, his fourth claim the central claim of his theory is that humans are not inherently superior to other living things. This is the most crucial belief, he says. It consists in the total rejection of the idea that humans are inherently superior. Now, we could take this claim in two ways. As a simple claim, it can simply refer to human abilities. I can't run as fast as a cheetah. I can't jump as high as many creatures, nor can you. You might jump much higher than me. Um, I can't climb as fast as a lemur. Uh, I can't dive as deep as a humpback whale. Can't hold my breath as long as an elephant seal. So many creatures have different capacities, and I'm not superior to them. But that's not what Taylor means. He believes that a genuine biocentric outlook must deny any superiority of value to humans. We're not superior in any sense to any other species. To claim that we are is speciesism. Now, we ought to reject racism. We ought to reject sexism. Uh, we ought to reject speciesism. The thought that our species is better than the others. Well, notice what he's done. He has said that we have the special ability to make moral judgments, and we ought to use that special ability to make a moral judgment to deny that we're special. We have the ability to make a moral judgment, and we ought to use that ability to say that we're not superior and we have that we have different values. Now, suppose I'm picking a, a pet for my children. It certainly seems appropriate for me to look at the different qualities of different animals. Golden retrievers have certain properties that an iguana doesn't, or a cockatoo, and so, or a boa constrictor. So I might try and push my kids towards getting a golden retriever instead of one of the other animals for a pet. And it's legitimate to look at the different properties and make judgments based on the different qualities. Taylor says, we cannot use the human quality of being able to engage in rational moral thinking to say there's any difference between us and other animals. But we do that all the time. I, I do that when I choose a pet for my children. I do that when I look at myself with respect to the rest of creation. Certainly when it comes to plants, 
Taylor happens himself to be a vegan, but he eats plants. Hmm. So he's judging some differences there. Ultimately, the problem here is theological. He has a bad anthropology. His view of what human beings are is contrary to the view that God has of what human beings are. He says, for example, the biocentric outlook provides a comprehensive view that leaves out nothing important or relevant. It gives us a total philosophical perspective on the whole realm of life and nature on earth. It is, fully, it is a fully adequate worldview regarding the domain of reality it is intended to cover, and he means all of reality. Uh, but on the face of it, that's just false. Because the biocentric worldview doesn't give us any ability to make aesthetic judgments about beauty, ugliness, about justice or injustice. It doesn't give us any basis for developing religion or philosophy. And these seem essential to what it is to be human. It's a reductionist view of human nature. That is, he's reducing, re reducing human nature to merely biological nature. And if that was all there was to it, he'd be right. But as Christians, we have to say there's more to humans than that. As creatures made in the image of God, there's a whole lot more. As members of the species, the nature of which was assumed by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are members of a species on which the incarnation has conferred infinite value. Far beyond that of a bighorn sheep or a great white whale, great white shark, great blue whale, whatever. You see my point. It's a theological problem in that he doesn't look at humans with a theological perspective. Now the fringe of this biocentric view would be found in Earth First. Uh, you may think this is just a crackpot. Arne Nass was a Norwegian philosopher, one of the prime proponents of a philosophy called deep ecology. Um, he sure liked to become one with nature. <laughs> And it's out of Ernie Nass's writings that the Earth First and, and uh, these kinds of radical environmentalist movements have come. And Paul Taylor has been worried about that, but he can find no legitimate way in his ethical system to keep it from going to be where the fringe is. Rather, he, he invokes something like social contract uh, to keep it from um, blowing up Hummer dealerships. Uh, as Earth First would do. Uh, the deep ecology people talk about these principles. They claim the flourishing of human life is compatible with the substantial decrease of the human population. The flourishing of non-human life requires such a decrease. Now, I'm not making this up. This is out of textbooks. Uh, and, and you need to realize that there is a, you already do, I'm just reinforcing how wacko the wacko environmental fringe is. Human life is compatible with decrease. Non-human life requires a decrease in the human population. Present human interference with the non-human world is excessive and the situation is worsening. Policies must be changed in view of the present ecological crisis. These policies affect basic economic, technological, and ideological structures. The resulting state of human affairs will be greatly different than they are in the present once the deep ecology platform is in place. Finally, those who accept these points have an obligation to try to contribute directly to the implementation of the necessary changes. This is what underwrites eco-terrorism. The problem is, no one who subscribes to this volunteers to be part of the <laughs> decrease. There's a, I lived in Boulder for a number of years in the mountains above Boulder. Boulder Abortion Clinic 
Dr. Warren Hearn is one of the few abortion providers in the country who still does late-term abortions uh, right up until delivery. Um, actually, I met my colleague Dave Horner picketing in front of his clinic uh, before either of us came out here. Warren Hearn gave a, a speech a few years back at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in which he described humanity in terms that oncologists use to describe cancers. And, and his claim was abortion is perfectly acceptable because we're helping prevent the spread of the cancer of humanity. But you see, if that were true, an oncologist doesn't simply want to stop the spread, he wants to get rid of the cancer and her not a volunteer. But of course he doesn't. Um, but it's scary when you hear this, this kind of rhetoric from these groups. Yes? I read recently, been a couple of weeks, that there are people who advocate that the human population should be reduced to a billion people, one billion people. One billion, wow. I don't know how they come up with that number, but uh, I wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me. That's a lot of reduction. Yeah. Some of the consequences of this kind of deep ecology or a thoroughgoing biocentric outlook. Baird Calicott, who doesn't subscribe to this, but he presents it this way. It's not only morally permissible, but from the point of view of the land ethic, morally required that members of a certain species be abandoned to predation or even culled. If that's true, how can we consistently exempt ourselves from similar draconian regimes? We too are only plain members or citizens of the biotic community. Do you get that? We ought to allow ourselves to be, have our population culled, to make ourselves available for predation. I suppose that would mean don't use mosquito nets in malaria areas, uh, stop taking uh, shots, you know, do away with penicillin. I don't know what he's talking about here. Another example, massive human diebacks would be good it is our duty to cause them. It is our species duty, relative to the whole, to eliminate 90% of our numbers. That's close to the one billion, right? It's our duty. But no one who writes this volunteers. Well, it's pretty clear that this biocentric outlook has some deep flaws, especially if it allows you to go to these extremes uh, and doesn't have anything more than social contract to say, uh, we're not going to go that far. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.